just wanted to say thanks for coming. I used to live here on the top of Ladbroke Grove, actually the summit of Notting Hill, in the days before it was Notting Hill. It was pretty much a slum then. It was the drug capital, well, said to be the drug capital of London. Terrific buzz in those days, no doubt there still is. Slightly different sort, perhaps. You didn't want to come down here on a dark night. Even the police only came in pairs. Anyway, I was writing my first uh, book, which, as Anna said, was a literary biography. But actually, what I was dreaming about was writing a book about China, which I have now finally done. Those days when I lived here feels like half a century ago. Well, in fact, probably it was half a century ago. But uh, I finally got round to it. And this book, although in theory it's about, I mean, it is about Pearl Buck, but that's because I write literary biographies. There wasn't a lot of choice. It started with a place rather than with a particular person. And when I, I've all my life wanted to go to China. And when I tried to work out why I wanted to do this so badly, because it goes back as long as I can remember, I realized it was because, I think it was because, of a picture book I had, probably, well, certainly the first picture book, possibly the only picture book, because I was a wartime child and there weren't many books about in those days, and it was called Chinese Children at Play. And it was about all these, no text, all these very small children with shaven heads and very bright red cheeks who played amazing games that I'd never heard of. They, had, they flew huge kites in the shape of uh, dragons and pavilions as big as, a, as, big as, a, as big as a real house. And they fought each other with scorpions. And they did, we fought each other with conkers on strings. You know, it was a very, very exotic world to me. And it, well, I think it, it shaped my life to some extent. Uh, I discovered a copy of it recently, copy, uh, my copy. It was in an attic of one of my brothers who claimed that it was his, but since I'm the oldest in the family, by definition, it was mine. <laughs> and it, it was actually published in 1939, before, even before I was born. And it had a preface by a Chinese man explaining that the Chinese were different from us. He said, well, we have, uh, we have flat faces and almond-shaped eyes instead of big noses and sunken eyes like you have. And obviously it was written for a, a, an English, a British audience, who'd never ever seen a Chinese person. And that is the span of my life. It started when a period when China was a faraway country of which we knew not, nothing, which no one had ever been to, or hardly anyone had ever been to, and ends up now when China is facing modernity, changing at a speed that is almost inconceivable. I'm, I'm going to tell you, I've only got one joke, because the story I'm about to tell you is not a funny one. Well, this joke was told me, it's not a joke either, it's true, by Xinran, a Chinese author whom I greatly admire. And she said she'd met a Chinese girl who'd been on attachment in this country, in Somerset, actually. I don't know what she was doing, but anyway, I imagine she was in Shepton Mallet or Juton Memdip, some place like that. And Xinran said to her, well, since you've been here so long, what do you think of the British? And she said, well, you know, they're so lazy. And Zinran said, well, what, 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 what do you mean? And she said, well, I've been here 18 months, heart of Somerset, remember, and they haven't changed the roads yet. <laughs> and I think that gives you some idea of the speed and scale of change that Chinese people are used to now. And, of course, the gigantic change in the way we think about them. And I think it is no exaggeration to say that the individual initially responsible for this change was Pearl Buck. Can I have my first slide? Here she is, aged 11, living in China. She'd spent all her life in China and fully expected to spend the whole of the rest of her life in China. She grew up in the world that seemed so exotic to me. She played those games. All her playmates were Chinese, and though she had yellow hair and blue eyes, they forgave her that. And she wore the same clothes as they did. 
The reason those clothes seem so exotic to me is that they were uh, fl flower pattern tops and loose, brightly coloured trousers, kind of clothes that all children wear today. But in those days, in the years after the war, when I grew up, we all always wore grey flannel. And Pearl, who is wearing here a traditional um, Victorian frock, only wore those clothes when her parents, the rare occasions when her parents made her pose for a photograph. She hated um, Western clothes, and that wasn't what she was used to. Her parents were American missionaries. Can I have my next slide? And uh, this is them. On the left, I'm sorry it's so dark, on the left is a picture of her parents on their wedding day. They were very young, they were idealists, they were about to sail for China, where they spent the rest of their life, and they knew nothing whatsoever about that country. And what they planned to do was to convert that entire vast nation to a very fundamentalist, Calvinist form of Christianity. And this remained Pearl's father's ambition, and he thought he would succeed to the very day he died. Though I may say, he made 10 converts in his first 10 years. So that just drove him on. Millions await our call, was his, um, his motto in life. Uh, the second picture shows them 15 years later with the three survivors of their six children. In the middle, you can hardly see her, that little face, is Pearl. Beside her is her baby brother, Clyde, and standing behind another little face is her eldest brother, Edgar, who was 10. In between her and Edgar were three children, two girls and a boy, who had died of cholera or malaria or dysentery, the way that children, Chinese children died in villages. Her parents lived in the village. They thought they should live with the people they'd come to bring this astonishing news to. Her little brother, Clyde, would die when he was four, quite suddenly, of a fever, as all the others had. And that is the world that Pearl knew, a world of disease and great poverty and flood and famine and bandits and civil war. That's what she grew up with. Her contemporaries, uh, well, female infanticide was very, very, very common in those days in China, and Pearl knew all about it, had seen it at first hand. She would also have watched all of her contemporaries having their feet bound. In fact, she worried sometimes how on earth she would ever get a husband, since her mother didn't seem to be planning to bind her feet. She also watched them later being sold off in forced marriages. She knew at first hand uh, the sex trafficking that went on. She was not part of, but she, she knew a lot of people who had endured the sex trade in Shanghai, which in those days was a rough do. So she said, Asia to me was the real world. America for her was a dreamland, and she never felt at home there, ever, not to the very end of her life. It was something that as a child her mother told her stories about, that strange place. Can I have my next slide? This um, is uh, Mr. Kong, who was Pearl's Chinese tutor. And he too died after teaching her for about two years of cholera. He'd been driven out of uh, Beijing in that great terrorist uprising of 1900. So this was the ordinary, everyday world that she knew intimately. She grew up, well, she had from the beginning, a very powerful imagination and a strong mind and a very clear vision of the future. She um, had no illusions, as most Amer well, the whole of America really did, about the Nationalist Party in China. In the 1920s, she lived in, Chang in Nanjing and taught at the university. That's not the two-minute bell, is it? Thank you. <laughs> she taught at the university uh, in the years when Chiang Kai-shek made it the capital of China, the moment when the Nationalists came to power. And several of his junior ministers had been her pupils or her husband's pupils from Nanjing University. So she knew all about them. And she had no illusions about the Communist Party either. Could I have my next slide? She was, Pearl was caught up in the first great clash in China between the Communists and the Nationalists, which took place in Nanjing in 1927 and was 
uh, a battle which ended, of course, with the victory of the nationalists and with the Chinese being exiled, uh, the communists being exiled. Pearl, this is a mud hut. And Pearl, as you can see, it's got one room. You can just see a glimmer of light in the middle of the doorway. That's its one room and its one window. There was actually another room, a secret room with no window beyond that, very small, with an earthen floor and earthen walls. And that is where Pearl and her family were hidden by this Chinese woman during the battle for Nanjing. And they, this is to say, Pearl, her husband, her two little girls, her father, her sister, the sister's baby and the sister's husband, all crammed into this tiny dark space. They could hear the crackling of the fires, they could hear the screaming and shouting of the lynch mobs that were running loose through the city. They could hear their own house being broken into and looted, and none of them expected to live through that night. They did, in fact. But, as I say, Pearl had no illusions about the way the communists used and would use violence in China. She had already foreseen China's future as a superpower and as the inevitable leader of Asia, those were her words, long before anybody else. This was 1925, 10 years before my book ends. I end in um, 1934, five, strictly speaking, the moment when she wrote The Good Earth and left China Forever. She was absolutely nobody. She was a dowdy missionary wife. Her marriage was breaking up. She had no money. She had no contacts. She had no prospects. She knew nobody. And she landed in America to find that her book, which had been refused by all the publishers to whom it was sent, until a very small publishing house, which was about to go bankrupt, accepted it. Anyway, she landed to be met by her publisher, who told her that she had become, overnight, a global bestseller. That's the end of my book. That is a, really a fairy story. Pearl, of course, oh, the good earth, I should say, has never been out of print and is still in print to this day. Uh, sells a million copies a year. Not what most of us poor authors think of as being forgotten, but still. In general terms, Pearl is a joke to the literary world. When I uh, first wrote a proposal for this book, Publishers were not at all enthusiastic. It was turned down by my publishers, who were Penguin. <laughs> yes. And uh, when I mentioned it to friends, a lot of my friends are writers, when I mentioned, didn't rather tentatively, the subject I was thinking about, Pearl Buck, they just looked embarrassed and changed the subject. So I didn't have much of a start with this book. But... I think Pearl was the ideal subject for me because what she did was to bring about a huge change or start, launch, a huge change in perception of China. An American historian said that nobody since Marco Polo, no Westerner since Marco Polo, had had a comparable effect to Pearl Buck. The Good Earth, her, the novel that she wrote as her kind of farewell to China. She was leaving very reluctantly. And this, she wrote, it's a story of ordinary farming people set in contemporary China, published in 1931. Could I have my next slide? This is a man, a Chinese village laborer, whom Pearl said looked exactly like her hero, Wang Lung. He made, first of all, Americans, and then the whole of the Western world, understand that Chinese people were ordinary people like they were. And that may not seem so revolutionary to you, but in those days it was absolutely revolutionary. The um, standard stereotype of the Chinaman in all published sources in, up until then was either a, um, well, you know, yellow skin, slit eyed villain with. 10 inch fingernails in opium dens doing frightful things, or um, Charlie Chan, the comic Chinaman. There was really nothing between those two standpoints. And Pearl made people see that the people of China were people like any other people, as they always had been to her. They were the only people that she knew. She said she wrote The Good Earth in Chinese, and she translated it into English as she went along. And that's why. 
Its style sometimes seems odd to us, seems rather biblical. Chinese friends tell me to this day that it can be translated absolutely directly into Chinese, which is not true of most English books. And it's because Pearl had already translated it the other way. Uh, can I have my next slide? This is the Chinese Shelley. Very, very handsome, very charismatic role model for a whole generation of young Chinese writers. Pearl was in love with him. He lived in Shanghai. But the last thing Chinese people of his generation wanted to write about was village life. There is no comparable document in Chinese. No Westerner had ever done anything similar to what Pearl did, and no Chinaman either. I'm just going to end with my image in which I took my title, Burying the Bones. I assume that was the two-minute bell, or was it someone else banging a glass? <laughs> 